Uh, thanks, Leith, for in inviting me. I've had a fantastic day, guys. I've been out at the Agricultural Greenhouse Gas Research Centre where they're trying to deal with the problem of methane emissions from cows, doing great work there. I've been at Massey University meeting numerous scientists and I spent you know, a great afternoon talking to the mayor and other people from the council. You've got so much great stuff going on here. And thanks for turning out. This is, really is a you know, great turnout. And I get, I get the sense, looking around the room, that most of you were around and maybe doing business on this day nearly 25 years ago. Does anyone have any idea what significant thing happened in New Zealand on this day? A few other things were going on, like a prayer by Madonna, it went to number one in New Zealand. <laughs> Urban Hoglin and Heidi Parkinen went into the bush near Thames, and this was the day that people said, hey, they haven't come out yet, and started looking for them, a bit grim. Anything else that went down in the history books that might be significant? The first email? Close. This, the, sorry? Sort of, in a, in a sense. This was the day that the New Zealand internet was switched on. April 16, 1989. Yeah, so I've just written a piece for the listener which is coming out um, a little bit belatedly, but about the 25th anniversary, and we saw in March the 25th anniversary of the web with Tim Berners-Lee at the CERN Centre in Switzerland, you know, came up with uh, the, the protocols uh, uh, that, that link web pages together that basically the internet and, and, and the World Wide Web relies on now for us to surf around it. But on that day in, in 1989, this guy John Holker was sitting in his office at Waikato University. He'd been sent this modem, that's John there on the left, and Andy Linton, a guy from Victoria University. These were the guys who were crucial to getting the internet going in New Zealand. And John had been sent this modem from NASA, and they, said, they didn't even send a manual. They said, don't touch any of the settings on this. Just plug the damn thing in and try and ping us in the US and we'll see if it works. So John was on his own and he, t he figured out that without the manual it wasn't going to work. There was something that wasn't working. So he unscrewed the lid and he pulled out this chip and he accidentally bent the pin on the chip. So he called up the, the guys from NASA and he said, look, I've got a problem here. I've got a bent pin and potentially a broken modem. They said, well, it's going to take six weeks by the time it gets back to the US for us to send you another modem. Why don't you just try and bend the pin back and plug it in and see what happens? And that's exactly what John did. And late that evening, he sent the first ping to the US internet backbone in California, and the ping came back. And that was really the, the start of the internet. It was a 9.6 kilobit per second connection. And some of you will remember connecting over a 9,600 9, board modem to, to go to your bulletin boards or to send email. And, um, and that's what John and, and a group of dedicated people in the universities, mainly at Victoria and Waikato, did. And they did it in the face of stonewalling from bureaucracy, both in the universities and in the, in the DSIR, as it was at the time, and particularly from the government, no leadership, um, no funding. In fact, it was NASA who, who, who half funded the first internet connection. And the reason they did, they had a vested interest. A lot of their scientists were going down to Antarctica to do stuff. They still do. Uh, and there was a real effort in the, in the 80s to monitor the ozone, the levels of ozone uh, over Antarctica. So they actually sent up, decommissioned the U-2 spy planes to measure the amount of ozone so Na NASA had a lot of people in Christchurch overseeing this, and they wanted to get all of that information back to the U.S. to analyze. And that's the, the real motivation for the Internet getting underway, was that this big U.S. body wanted to do it, and New Zealand actually did it before Australia, so we were, we were leaders in that. But I think you know, the, the, the two interesting things out of that is that it was leaders. This wasn't a top-down thing. This was a grassroots thing. All these people came together across the university system and went, Wow, wouldn't it be great if we could email our colleagues in the UK and in Europe and the US? If we could, instead of them sending us you know, tape drives with, with data on it to do our experiments, they could just send it over uh, the, the network. So they just did it. They didn't ask for permission. They just barged their way through and used whatever resources they could. And the other thing is, a lot of people at the time were saying, 9.6 kilobits per second, what the hell are we going to do with all of that capacity? <laughs> No one knew what, 
what they'd fill it up with. And, uh, you know, they, so people were going, no, 4.8 will do, you know. <laughs> um, so, yeah, two lessons out of there. It, it, it comes from the grassroots disruptive change like that, not from the establishment bureaucracy. They can hopefully help out and try not to obstruct you, but it is a grassroots thing, and you just don't know the what's going to be used on these pipes. All you do know is that the, the internet means exponential change and growth and exponential disruption. And Dave's going to talk to you about you know what his business and others are doing uh, to, to leverage that. Who would have thought, you know, just two weeks ago, Telecom released a flat rate 100 megabit per second connection for small businesses and home users for 139 bucks. Where we, this is how far we've come in 25 years, the fact that you can get that now, all the data you can eat. You know, this network is rolling out across the country. This is what Palmerston North's looking like. The dark blue is stuff where supposedly that fiber has been laid by Chorus and is available now to plug into, although I've heard some horror stories about that today. And the light areas are stuff that's coming by, I think, 2016. Now, it's not perfect. Yeah. Uh, I had to pay $10,000 to get fiber into the building, yeah. and I paid $2,000 a month for 50, giga, 50 gigabytes of data at 10 megabits. Wow, yeah. So, yeah, look, the, the, the barriers are so much lower, and people will probably groan at, at, at this because, you know, there, there, it is uneven. I'm in the center of Wellington on, on Tory Street in Wellington, and I can't get fiber. There's some bizarre thing about apartment buildings where it's hard to get into. So fiber is spreading all around me, and I'm just a little oasis of dark fiber, you know. So, and, and, and listening to what Leith is, is saying about all of those households probably out around here that don't even have internet. And what Chorus is saying is we're going to go to schools first, and the school is very welcome to turn that fiber connection into a wireless network to extend coverage out. So hopefully that will happen. It needs leadership both from the council and from the private sector and the education sector. That's, I think, the quickest way to get to those households who, who aren't even on these lit up areas. There's probably a bit of cynicism about, around Gigatown as well, and I think that's reasonably valid. You know, Chorus has, what's gone on there in the last uh, six months or so has, has been a complete debacle. You know, we've got a, a, a listed company there that was set up to, to do a job that isn't fundamentally sustainable. The business model actually doesn't support it because the price of copper is being regulated down and down. It's becoming cheaper to stay on the old technology. And they knew this was going to happen. It's more expensive on the fiber technology. Why would you shift unless you can see the, the value of making that transition? And what New Zealand telcos and content providers haven't done yet, and, and uh, I don't see too much change happening soon, is selling the value of moving to the fiber world. Um, they've really let themselves down there. But fundamentally, I think, um, you know, Gigatown is a good thing to get the conversation going, people like you to start talking about what do we want from connectivity in our city. And as I, as I said, you know, I think the fundamental thing, as I was saying to the mayor today, is the more connectivity, the, be the better. The more networked and connected cities are, the more innovative they are, the more prosperous they are. That's a proven fact. That's backed up by all the science. Back in 2002, I went to South Korea. I went for the World Cup at the time, which was great, FIFA World Cup. But I also got around all the telcos and, and fiber providers. In 2002, every apartment building in Seoul had 100 megabit per second connections flat rate. We were probably then, maybe I was getting 2 megabits per second ADSL. But you know that was probably quite expensive at, at the time, and you know this was before the rise of Samsung and LG, uh, and I went to a gaming parlor there, and you know the people who took me there said this is what people are doing with this connectivity because they didn't know really what to do to fill up that pipe, uh, 100 megabits, so they used real-time gaming applications, but the rise of these tech giants like LG and Samsung and some of the other ones that are less well-known is linked to the connectivity that they invested in. And they have big advantages there. They have um, you know, high population density and that sort of thing, and there was big incentives from government. But the other, South Korea is the second most uh, connected country in the world. They have an average peak download speed 
of 60 megabits per second. And the other four in the, in the top five, uh, I think, are Singapore, Hong Kong, Japan, and Israel. And they happen to be some of the most innovative countries in the world. So that link is there. So the message that I've been g giving to the council and the mayor is fight for as much connectivity as you can. Be the gigatown, even if you don't win the competition. Pretend you are the gigatown, because the more connectivity, uh, the, the spin-off benefits are, are huge. I, this is a piece I wrote in January, and this is just one sector that is experiencing exponential growth as a result of the internet. This is the, the video game sector in New Zealand. It grew 86% last year. It's tiny, it's only about $40 million a year, but it's growing massively. And it's not PlayStation and Xbox games, it's games that you can download from the App Store. So I interviewed a guy here who lives in the Hawke's Bay. He has developed three or four games that he puts on the App Store for free. There's in-game advertising. He's a millionaire, the guy's in his early 30s, he, he sells a game called Chopper and Chopper 2, really simple, blocky sort of game. But millions of people have downloaded that. Last year, 130 million New Zealand games were downloaded. That has, you know, that's having a, a cultural impact beyond you know, our, our man Booker Prize winning um, author, you know, Eleanor Catton, who's done great work. But this, no one really knows about this, but it's really built on the back of the connectivity and consumers being really used to downloading games now rather than buying them on a disc and putting them uh, in their PlayStation. Where I come from in Wellington, you know, we're lucky that it is a, a hub for video game development and we've just seen this Melbourne company, Camshaft Software, move to Wellington. They're a small uh, company, but they've gone there because there are really cool companies like Pickpock and, and like uh, some of the spin-offs around Weta. It is a good place to develop games. Th th this is just an example of, of People who founded companies in Colombia, one of the key guys is, is one of the founders of Groove Shark, and these arrows are people who founded companies and then moved on to found other companies. And it's just an example of the, the network effect that happens when you have creative knowledge industry people in one place. They go and talk to other people, they set up other companies. And the more that you can encourage that sort of stuff, both from a you know, policy level, from infrastructural support, having the connectivity, the more innovative your city is going to be and the more prosperous. Uh, Professor Sean Hendy, who's um, from uh, Palmerston North, he's now a, he's a physicist at the University of Auckland. One of the things that he does is he maps innovation networks. And this is a map of the biggest innovation network in the country, 450 researchers. And this is agri-science. So every red dot on there is a researcher. And the bigger the dot is, the more patents that researcher has. And what he's found is that you know, this is our innovation ecosystem in that particular ecosystem. 450 researchers, Fonterra's at the middle of it, Ag Research, Reddit, and all of those companies, Dairy NZ. That is our biggest innovation ecosystem in the country. And, and he has found that the bigger those ecosystems get, the more interconnected they get, the more patents are created. And he's written a book called Get Off the Grass, where he's encouraging us to think as a... As a as a, a country, a, a, basically imagining ourselves as a city of four million because big cities um, with more people, more connectivity, more connections and networks mean more innovation. But you don't have to be in a big city to do that. You can just be in a small 80,000 person city but be very connected and networked and have similar spin-offs. I was here a couple of weeks ago, Steve Mahari gave a great talk about Food HQ. I think that's uh, fantastic, this idea, this golden mile through the university where there's going to be all these uh, uh, companies and research institutes, you know, $250 million over the next 10 years. It's the logical place to do it. Um, but sh as Sean Hendy points out, you know, and the title says it all, get off the grass, there are limits to growth, to intensification of dairy and our other agriculture. And his fundamental view is that we need to get off the grass and become more focused on the knowledge economy, on the digital, the weightless uh, economy that experiences that exponential growth where we can build stuff here and sell it to the rest of the world like Xero is trying to do. If they crack the US market, you know, their, their share price is going to triple because this is something they can sell again and again and again to millions of US companies to do their accounting. So he's saying that's the sort of stuff, keep our roots, uh, our agricultural edge is, is what's really valuable, but look to other things. And I've been talking to some scientists who are based here. This is um, 
Varigate, a company you might know here. Um, Pierre Rudin is a Frenchman who works at Landcare Research. He came up with some patented technology to look at the, the, the soil moisture level in particular parts of your field uh, to analyze that and see exactly where the irrigation needs to be. So instead of just spraying an entire field, pinpoint irrigation that you can control from a smartphone whether you're on the, on the farm or not. And this is the sort of start of this revolution called agricultural analytics, where you're taking all this data from sensors, and this is land care technology they're using for the sensors, extracting that data so that you can much more efficiently manage your farm. Another company, many of you will know, um, Precision Irrigation, sold recently back in 2010 to Lindsay, one of the, the big irrigation companies in the world. These were Massey University graduates. Again, this is making irrigation really efficient and manageable of using automation, sensors, cloud computing, and your smartphone. That's what farmers can do to manage uh, their pasture now much more efficiently. And as Pierre said to me, with things like the Ruatanifa Dam, uh, more dams going in around the place, more irrigation schemes, with intensification, we're going to have to get a lot smarter about how we use irrigation systems because um, we need to get more sustainable. That's just a fundamental thing, and technology can help us do that. And the people in this town have the skills to do it. This is big business. The Climate Corporation out of Silicon Valley, this is a bunch of ex-Google engineers who set this uh, thing up, the Climate Corporation. They take analytics, a lot of climate data. They can look at all different types of crops and where you should plant at what times of the year. Um, insurance companies use this to plan their risk for insuring uh, crop companies. They were sold last year to Monsanto for $1.1 billion. You know, so the sort of numbers we're seeing in, in the social media networks, the Twitters and all that, we're starting to see the huge value in this and it's all about that big data, taking all of that data from sensors and automation on the farm and giving farmers intelligence into their business and that is something we could definitely do here. But just, you know, some of you may be retailers here. If you look to what our biggest retailer is doing, it's all digital. Look at the acquisitions they've made in the last few years, Torpedo 7, um, the Pet Shop, um, One Day, which is the Daily Deal site. You know, so they've put millions of dollars into these startups. And I think that's an indication of where things are going. Everything needs to be e-commerce enabled now in a nice way. You know, the growth, I think, is about 15%. Uh, and, and online sales in New Zealand. A lot of it's going straight offshore to Amazon and places like that, and that's a lot of pain for, for retailers who are missing out on all that value, but the reason they're going there is the, is the selection and, and, and the choice and the, and the shopping experience is better in many cases than going to the high street. The only way to, do, to, to counter that is to be really good e-commerce operators yourselves. It also goes for things like real estate, you know, to, to, to build a place where talent wants to live. The digital natives who are, who are creating cool apps and software and all that, they don't want to work in the traditional corporate environment. They want to work in funky, cool loft spaces. So real estate agents need to, and, and property developers need to keep that in mind. If you want to have a cool hub where people are going to congregate and network and get all of those efficiencies and benefits and spin-offs from that, they've got to have cool places to work. So this digital thing permeates every part of the economy and every sector from commercial property uh, through to retail. It's meeting, and not here in Palmerston North yet, but Trust Power is, you know, this is quite innovative, bundling everything onto one bill. So just making it really nice for the consumer experience. So you, you just pay for everything on one bill and maybe get a, a decent discount because of that. Actually, telecom doesn't really do that anymore. You can't bundle all of those things together. So you're starting to see innovative things like that and Trust Power is definitely in the fibre game in, in Hamilton and coming to Wellington and Auckland as well. And this is an interesting trend. You're seeing one of the big choke points for the uptake of fibre is there aren't any really good uh, video services that you can use legitimately here in New Zealand. But some, some statistics came out last month, 180,000 Kiwis are using virtual private networks in New Zealand. Now some of them are downloading dodgy stuff, but the vast majority of them are quite legally tunneling into the US to access Hulu and Netflix and Amazon and in the UK I, the iPlayer service because there is a bottleneck here where it's either Sky TV or pretty much 
whatever you can scrape and, and, and scrimmage on the, on the internet. So there are opportunities here for both for local content providers and the infrastructure players like the Vodafones which is now doing Sky directly over the internet cables rather than from a satellite. And that is going to change the economics of their business when you don't have to pay $30 million a year to have transponder space on a satellite because you can deliver it over fiber. The game changes completely. E-health, you know, the, this, they're trialing this at hospitals around New Zealand where instead of having a doctor come up to you physically, someone remotely is, is, is talking to you and one of these devices here is taking your vital signs and that's just something that is going to be an increasing trend, telemedicine, um, and that's enabled by good connectivity by fiber. One other uh, area I think there's big opportunity in, in Palmerston North and perhaps will come with as the connectivity comes is the big data revolution and being a host for that. So these are pictures from Datacom's data warehouse in Hamilton and recently they just expanded that by a third because they're struggling to keep up with the demand for storing data. All of those companies out there from insurance companies to Air New Zealand to banks, they're all generating massive amounts of data. Ministry of Social Development is getting this in, into this in a big way putting all their databases together to extract really good quality information about their users, this will only get bigger. Now the reason that Hamilton is hosting this massive data center is because it's not in a seismically prone region. Well, Palmerston North is a, is a very good, safe region to have data warehousing as well. And what they find in places where these have gone in around the world is that it spawns other businesses because the, the connectivity and the capacity for storing large amounts of data is so much better. And once again, the agricultural analytics, any of the big data applications that Massey or the CRIs are doing, you know, they just love this sort of stuff. So yeah, just to come, come to the end, I just want to talk briefly about a couple of examples from the US. You may have heard about this place in Tennessee called Chattanooga, which uh, is a little um, town that in 1963 Walter Cronkite uh, called the most polluted town in the US. So it, it's come from a really industrial background. Through the 90s and, and early 2000s it was um, not doing very well. A lot of people were leaving there to go to, to other places. And they found that the power company there that there was some fiber that had been built around the city and abandoned. So they took that up and some leaders in the council and in the power board said let's make this a gigabit ethernet city for every business and, and household in the city. And they did that um, several years ago and it's become a real example of, of what can be achieved when that happens. They, they can attribute nearly 7,000 new jobs created as a result of doing that. The amount of capital and venture capital coming into the city has increased fivefold in, in Chattanooga. People are basing their data centers there. Um, logistics companies are going there because the connectivity is so good. So it was a big punt for them but it's paid off and there's all these social efficiencies as well. So the power board um, is able to connect up street lights, traffic lights, everything over this um, network as well. There's free Wi-Fi throughout parts of the city as well. So Chattanooga is, is a good example, I think, because it's only 160,000 people. Um, but what they've been able to do by having the courage to say we're going to be a digital city, we don't know quite what we're going to fill these pipes with, but they built it. And, um, and they came. And the other one you know, is, is probably the exemplar in the world for digital cities, which is here, as long as you're delivering really good services to New York citizens. And, and they had a universal access policy. So they wanted to get internet access to everyone across New York, no matter how, whether it was fiber, Wi-Fi, free in libraries, that sort of stuff. And these are now the things that they measure themselves on. You probably can't read the writing, but 300,000 additional low-income residents able to access internet uh, since the launch of the digital roadmap. So key to their DNA now are these sorts of things. How engaged are they through nyc.gov? How many people engaged in their social media channels during Hurricane Sandy to get information about that? Um, industry, how much money has been generated from technology acquisitions in New York? 8.3 billion. Over a thousand technology companies now in New York. So these are the things that the, the new mayor and the council is going, that's showing the health 
off our city. That's what's going to make talent want to live here instead of in Silicon Valley. And open government. How many um, sets of data have we shared with application developers out there to turn into useful applications for our people? 2,000 sets of data. Rather than holding on to that data and saying, can we, this is commercially sensitive or whatever, they've just given it all away. And that's some of the apps that they've created. Taxi stuff, apartments, where are the, where are the tr location of trees in, in New York City. Whatever you want, people can do it. So look, I guess my closing message to you guys is, you know, look where you guys are on the, on the Gigatown rankings at the moment, 12. So there's scope to up, up your game. I think Wanaka will probably take it out. They've got a huge lead. A gigabit Ethernet into Wanaka. I don't know what they're going to do with it, but hey, you know, that's the whole point. But whatever happens with this, I think this is a bit of a cynical thing by Chorus to drum up business and interest, but we do need to have this conversation about how important connectivity is, how important the concept of a digital city is to us as citizens. It's important in Wellington. It's important in Auckland. This is competitive. This is a competition, but we're, we're in a bigger competition to keep and retain talent and to build cities that are places where people um, are fulfilled, particularly the digital natives who want to work in these vibrant um, knowledge economy companies. So we have to keep that in mind. I think there's huge potential to do that here with a little bit of leadership from the council, but that grassroots leadership from you guys as well. So thanks for having me. That's me on Twitter. What did the mayor say? Fantastic meeting with, with the mayor, you know. Um, very receptive on the business development side. I think the overriding thing that came out, which, which he really agreed uh, about, which David had a lot of input into, is that there just needs to be more awareness of what everyone is doing in this town and how they can help each other out. More networking, more connectivity. And that doesn't necessarily need to be led by Vision Manawatu or the council or whatever, but in, in Wellington this sort of happens and has been happening for years where I'll, I'll walk into an e evening like this and Sam Morgan and Rowan Simpson and Rod Drury and all these guys who are regularly getting on planes to Silicon Valley are there imparting their knowledge and very generous with, with their knowledge. They're coming up with business plans together and we just need to see, I think, more of that sort of style of stuff happening uh, here in Palmerston North, people getting together more often and trying to figure out how they can help each other out. Uh, hey everybody, um, this is a, just sort of a, a quick summary slide on some of the businesses um, that we've worked with over the last uh, little while, uh, while we've been, I guess, transitioned into an export focused business because we've actually got a long history here as was mentioned, nearly 20 years and in fact uh, Nick from Trio is here which is, you know, one of our technology spin-offs that, uh, and that's a very small graph so far, but um, and I think, uh, you know, it's, it's a great testament to the people we've been able to either um, grow within the Palms North region or attract to the Palms North region, um, some of the products we've created and some of the partners we sell those through. And all of those products are translated into 16 languages and sold into 130 countries worldwide. Um, this is the new product which we're in the process of, of launching and uh, it's, it's really extremely exciting for me and, and I've been in the business uh, a long time. In fact, I remember those days when the internet was being switched on and we were still trying to use uh, prior protocols to HTTP and we were trying to ping IP addresses and HP would try and charge me for downloading files because they hadn't, no one had quite figured how the internet worked back then. Um, and, uh, and, and this is, it's like an avalanche coming at us. Um, the, the numbers I'll show you in a minute on cell phone usage as an internet connected device are a little bit mind blowing. I think they actually all make sense to us when we think about if we've got smartphones, how we use them. Um, uh, but this new technology, you imagine, uh, basically lets any designer code-free uh, create their own apps for both uh, desktop installation. So in this case, this is a Can kiosk. You use that name because it's really easy to find on mobile. Well, actually, it's a very funny example because uh, we were talking with some Singaporean investors, and our, our current technology name was called Blaze. And we were saying, well, you imagine if you know, we'll be having these big discussions, and we were doing our terrible Kiwi run-on word problem we have, and they're saying, what is this word you imagine you keep saying? And it was just us stringing together two parts of a word. So that became uh, you know, what is now a very unique brand, but also very aspirational to what we're trying to do. And it really does, um, it will become a core cool part of our marketing strategy as well. So um, we're presenting something in front of people that, in this case up here, is tracking my hand in 3D, tracking my face, 
this, is, this example uses voice recognition. Um, this was done in, uh, in combination with Toyota New Zealand to show off the Lexus um, vehicle. The great thing is this was not just an in-store application, but it was also a take-home application. So you could have it on your phone, you could use augmented reality. And, uh, and this actual uh, case study here um, won the, the Gold Apex Award at the Digital Signage Expo in Las Vegas earlier this year in February. So, um, you know, it's a very exciting space we're moving into and we couldn't be more excited really. Um, Most people don't know what augmented reality is. Well, it's, it's an interesting problem because there are many technologies we work with that people don't know about yet. But one of the challenges is even knowing that those, ex those things exist doesn't help you. Because today, if you see a cool piece of augmented reality, then to find a vendor who's going to work with you, maybe you have to, uh, have to find someone in Jakarta and you have to decide are they a safe person to work with. So in the case of augmented reality, what we can do is I can hold up a phone or hold up a device and then what it will do is it will recognize an image that's on the ground. So in this case, um, literally you put down a magazine in your driveway, you take your phone and you point it at that magazine and uh, what actually happens on your phone is you now see a, uh, a new ISF 350 uh, Lexus in your driveway. You can choose the color and you can literally see the car, uh, sorry, your house around it reflected in the windows of the car and then you can share that photo on social networks like Facebook uh, which is a great example of social proof, very aspirational, and then you get a free test drive, right? So, um, and it's those kind of things that really get advertising agencies excited. And uh, you, you, if you look at the stats, so 80% of devices in 2013 shipped from mobile, that's getting much, much higher. 80% um, of the time that people spend on their devices is not browsing websites, it's using mobile apps. And 90% uh, of the apps were free. So there's this, there's this huge, huge rush towards getting your content, making it available on phones, and you know, realistically, a lot of people aren't even aware it's, it's happened yet, but it really has happened. Um, um, this is some of the stats for building a native mobile app. So um, you know, that's been a real challenge. People like Xero, which is obviously a, a website-based accounting system, have released a native app for the phone because the, you, to, to work on a phone, you really have to engage with all of the, the capabilities the phone has. It's not the same as using a mouse on a desktop. Um, the same thing with Facebook. So Facebook was having a lot of problems with mobile. Um, not long after they launched, it was one of their really big problems. And since launching their native app, and now um, they've totally turned that part of their business around and they're now very successful on mobile. And the reality is if you want to have a great experience, it has to be with a native app. Um, and if you look at the costs, however, you know, it's very, very easy to be spending $60,000 and upwards. And that's no surprise. You need a project manager, you need some QA people, you need some developers. You probably need that whole thing duplicated because you're doing it on iOS or Android or Windows. You're probably outsourcing it offshore. Um, we had a very interesting discussion at the, at the big retail show in New York where we were lucky enough to, to present with Intel, um, where a, a CEO of a very big advertising agency um, uh, told us a story about a, a partner of theirs, who'd, a friend of his in fact, who had just, as he put it, dropped 200,000 pounds on an app for Valentine's Day and he'd, he'd literally just got a text and he just checked his phone and said, uh, they're going to be two weeks late, the outsourcing firm we've used, there's nothing I can do about it, what's the point in having a Valentine's Day app? when you're not hitting Valentine's Day, right? Um, and and as, a, as, a, as an executive, that's a very stressful situation because you can't make um, Bob and Jenny stay late and finish that because it's not under your control, it's being outsourced. So, so this is a real problem, there's a massive disconnect because as you can see, everybody needs it and at the moment it's still very expensive. And this is not that different to when we started our company back in 1996. Um, in fact, you know, I did a lot of consulting you know, well prior to that. And um, you know, if you were to build an e-commerce site, that was a very, very leading edge thing to do. And you could easily spend $200,000 building an e-commerce site. And I'm sure you probably remember some of the money that many large uh, New Zealand companies have been mentioned already um, spent on big e-commerce systems that all failed um, because it was a really hard thing. And, uh, and the reality is that needs to change. And that's what we're trying to do with you, Imagine. Th this is the development tools market and, and we're gonna take a slice of that, but what we think is that the, actually the market's much bigger because this is the market for developers to use it. We want everybody to be able to use it. Well, certainly designers to use it because if you want something to look good, you know, you still need to involve um, creative people and your marketing, your business people. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the, um, the regional focus and some of the oppor opportunities and challenges uh, that come from working in a regional centre. I mean, we started very small <laughs> and it was a, a pretty hard thing to do to start a, a, an export um, business in Palms North, um, especially just out of university. So it was a, you know, it's been a, a, a long, a long road, and we've, I think we've learned quite a few things. So. Um, one of the first things I'd say is digital diversity. I mean, I think 
you know, digital is the best opportunity to not be pigeonholed. And there's been discussions about should we all focus on the same area. I think um, you know, there's huge opportunities to share knowledge, but uh, I don't think we should be locking down what we're doing into a particular sector. I think the whole point of digital diversity is you can digitally enable any business. And it shouldn't need to be about technology anymore in the sense that you don't have to learn how to do all the stuff under the hood. The point is that technology enables your business just like other things do. I mean, we don't consider it a strange thing that we have accounting packages now. But, uh, you know, I can tell a story where um, we were integrating Mass University's e-procurement system with some of their vendors. And uh, one of the suppliers who supplied musical instruments uh, from the US still sent handwritten invoices um, that we had to scan. So, you know, it's, it's, you know we, we take things for granted once they've happened, but when you look Today, you don't consider technology as something you should just have and not have to worry about. Um, and in terms of the uh, sharing challenges and solutions, I think that's a huge opportunity. And I think it's something that's missed. We went through a lot of learning. Where if I'd been, you know, sitting in those uh, in those pubs with uh, Rowan and Rod earlier, you know, maybe I would have had a better chance to pick that knowledge up, um, you know, five or ten years uh, ahead of where we finally found it after a lot of hard work. Um, in terms of challenges and opportunities, I mean, distance from markets is a real problem, but interestingly, it's a problem no matter where you are in New Zealand. If you're exporting, it doesn't matter if you're in Auckland, Wellington, or Palmerston North, you're still a long way from your market. In reality, it doesn't matter. All of the people we deal with, um, you know, if I'm on a call, say, with a, a factory in uh, China, they're probably on someone from Taiwan, someone from Singapore, someone from the US, someone from the UK. Sometimes I mean, it's exactly. It, like, it, it, you know, we get up earlier than some people, it works out really well. So, um, you know, in, in the end, um, I don't think distance from markets is a problem that is solved by moving somewhere else in New Zealand. I think it's definitely a problem. Um, and we've, you know, it took us a while to find the right people and, and be able to employ, you know, really good sales executives in the US. And to, uh, you know, I just spent a lot of time in, uh, I think, 2010, where we were signing one of the Dell deals. I spent about 200 uh, days in Austin, Texas. Um, despite flying back every two weeks. Um, so it's, it's, a, uh, you know, it's, it's a challenging thing. Being there is really important, and I'll, I'll go into that in a second. Um, in terms of staff, um, you know, it's a slow burn. It's really hard to grow quickly here in the minute or two, but you can not just grow the talent that's here, and we've got some world-leading experts that have come from Mass University and um, you know, from the, the lower North Island region who, who work for us now. And we've also attracted people from places like um, the Ukraine or Japan, um, who've moved here for lifestyle reasons. You know, they've got perhaps a little uh, farming block. And in fact, um, when we talk to uh, VCs in the Valley, we're, we're looking to raise some capital at the moment. Um, you talk to VCs in the Valley and you explain that our average staff tenure is uh, over eight years and they're a bit confused um, because the, the half-life for an employee in Silicon Valley is around about six months before you need to be doing something about it and, and either managing them or um, giving them a better offer or, you know, they're going to be stolen by some small startup. And that's despite... You know, obviously there's a court case going on at the moment between a number of large players like Google and Apple and so on who are said to have um, basically had a no poaching agreement. So despite those kind of existing challenges in place, there's still a big movement of stuff. Yeah, well, I think it's an interesting, it's an interesting thing. I mean, we, we go through um, uh, both having people who have come with experience beforehand, and I think that's been valuable in some areas. And we've also gone through the process of basically, you know, growing people from scratch. And I think, you know, both are very important. Is, uh, is critical and having good onboarding procedures is, has been a you know, huge learning experience for us. Um, capital, capital's mighty challenging um, in New Zealand full stop. Um, and I think you know, particularly in, in Palmerston, it's not something you can easily do. You have to um, travel and, and get to the hubs where uh, capital exists. So um, it's, it's not something that's perhaps for or, or a computer store today. You'll see our software on up to 10 different HP machines, on right. Dell machines, on a whole range of, of machines, you'll see that software. And I guess the challenge is that, that as, a, as a pathway for consumers, people have been moving much more into, as you can see, into the mobile space. So um, as I say, there's nothing much we can do to solve that problem for very large corporations worldwide. In fact, Sony just sold their business to Lenovo to, to put that into perspective. I'll take my question because I actually have a few. Um, and I think in terms of being there, I think that's something that's really important. Um, and uh, as I discussed, having, a, having our US-based representative who understands the US from a sales perspective has been a massive learning curve for us. I mean, that's been huge. Um, it's, it's really hard to describe the difference between how Kiwi sell and how our US people sell. Um, in fact, we, we essentially got in a position where there was a, there, there was a miscommunication occurring because we were pitching here because you, don't, you want to, you know, 
under promise and over deliver and the record say well they must be really bad because I'm used to pitching people pitching me here when they only get get here so you know we end up they think oh you must be down here so it was yeah, it was very it was a very challenging situation and uh, and I think um, and I don't mean misrepresenting yourself that's not what that's not what I mean I just mean you know being a bit more bullshit about it and it's been great and a great experience for us and certainly for me to learn um, and in terms of being there you know it's, it's critical uh, this is the big big show in New York this is the digital synergy expo in Las Vegas and um, you know you're at these shows uh, in, the, in the case of this one here um, Intel used about I think it was about 150 sales staff to make appointments and meetings there were we just had people coming past non-stop um, you know the CIO of Walmart e executives all over the place um, it's just an experience you're not going to get anywhere else um, you've you've got a space there you, you get to talk to people basically the whole <laughs> you know two days it runs you run your pitch through everybody's learning it's a it's a huge experience and um, you know the reality is if we had come in ourselves bought a little wee corner booth like most Kiwis company do on the on the third floor down in the bottom right hand corner you get a totally different crowd of people coming to visit you so um, you know I think this is it's a it's a it's a great thing if you can figure out how to do it so that partnering and using you know massive companies to to help you get visibility has been a really important strategy for us